truly it is a glad day to be in the house of the Lord one more time. We bring you greetings from South Suburban Missionary Baptist Church, a church where God is up to something and that something is big. My name is Brother Nicholas Bradley. I'm the tech leader here at South Suburban, and I will be your host for the month of August. If you are watching via Facebook Live or YouTube, we ask that you would share this service to your timeline so that everyone can participate in worship with us on this morning. To kick off our service this morning, we will bring one of our deacons to offer us a scripture and a prayer. Praise the Lord, saints. We give all honor and praises to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We thank God for allowing us to see another first Sunday. Sunday comes, we all are in celebration and wanting to give our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, all the praise, all the honor, and all the glory. So on this morning, my name is Deacon LaVon Trailer, and I will be offering up your scripture and your prayer on this morning. Our scripture will be coming from the 121st number of Psalms, and it reads, I will lift up my eyes unto the hills from which cometh my help, my help cometh from the Lord which made heaven and earth. He will not suffer thy foot to be moved. He that keepeth thee will not slumber. Behold, he that keepeth Israel shall neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord is thy keeper. The Lord is thy shade upon thy right hand. The sun shall not smite thee by day nor the moon by night. The Lord shall preserve thee from all evil. He shall preserve thy soul. The Lord shall preserve thy going out and thy coming in from this time forth and ever forevermore. The word of God is already blessed. Shall we pray? O oh, gracious and merciful God, we come thanking and praising you, God, for this another day you have given us. Lord, we have fallen short of your glory, and we ask on this morning, Lord, that you forgive us of all our iniquities and our transgressions. Lord, if we sin against you and sin against others, we ask right now, Father God, that you cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Lord, we ask on this morning, Father God, as we go forth in this service, that you allow your Holy Spirit just to rest in this place. So have your way, Lord. So, Lord, we lift up the, the congregation to you on this morning, Lord. We ask that you just touch uh, as only you can. Father God, it, those who need you as a healer, we ask that you heal right now in the name of Jesus. And Father God, if someone, Father God, needs a financial blessing, Father God, you said the count of a thousand hills all belong to you. So all we have to do is just ask and believe, and you should give it. So, Lord, we ask right now in the name of Jesus, Father God, as we go through this service on the day, that you bless the speaker. Give them a rain of word from on high, Lord. Let your word go forth, Father God, as never before. Let it prick the hearts of your people that they may ask, what must I do to be saved? And those, Father God, who are already in the fold, we ask that you bring back to their remembrance your goodness, Father God, that they may line up with your word. Father God, we ask that you bless our pastor over here at South Suburb Missionary Baptist Church. We ask that you give her all the, everything that she stands in need of, Lord. Let her be the leader that you desire. Father God, we ask right now in the name of Jesus that if we need you, Father God, you promised that you would show up. So we need you right now, Father God, in our lives. Father God, we're not complaining or grumbling. We just want to celebrate you on today. So, Lord, we ask you just creating us a clean heart, renewing us the right spirit. Stir up the gifts that sent us, Lord, that we may have a celebration on this day. Father God, why? Because you are worthy of all the honor, all the praise, and all the glory. So, Lord, we ask right now in the name of Jesus that you just have your way in this place. And then, Father God, we'll forever give honor and praise to your name. This is your servant's prayer. Amen. Now it is time for us to worship God through song. I don't know about you, but one of my favorite ways to connect with God is through my voice with music. So wherever you are on this Sunday morning, whether you're in your living room, your kitchen, or even if you're listening to us while driving in your car, we ask that you participate with us in praise and worship on this morning. Please receive our praise team as they bring us election. Thank you. 
it's time for everyone's favorite part of service, the listening and the hearing of the preached word of God. The word says, how can we hear without a preacher? And how can they preach unless they be sent? I assure you that the person that is coming forth today is sent by God to give us a word for this point in time. Please welcome our speaker this morning as they bring us a word. I want to turn our attention today to the book of Matthew, the 14th chapter. We're going to start reading right at the 34th verse. And it reads, when they had crossed over, they landed at Gennesaret. And when the men of that place recognized Jesus, they sent word to all the surrounding country. People brought all their sick to him and begged him to let the sick just touch the edge of his cloak and all who touched it were healed. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we recognize and honor your presence in this virtual space. Come in and sit with us, converse with us, convene with us and congregate with us as we call upon you. Lord, allow your train to drop from heaven. Fill this space and take control of every thought. Open our eyes wide so that we may see better. Open our ears fully so that we might hear better. Open our hearts entirely so that we might receive your word better. As your word goes forth mightily through the airwaves, we pray that it travels to unknown places, travels to unopened hearts, travels to unsought people, and that your word finds them and transforms them. And so, Lord, as I decrease and you increase, allow your word to go forth and not return to you void, but accomplish everything it sets out to do. For a sermonic title on today, I want to talk about just a touch. Just a touch. You, like me, may be tired of hearing about COVID-19. The world was starting to open up back again, and COVID-19 was going to be a thing of the past. It is disheartening then to hear that there is another variant of the coronavirus on the rise. In fact, after we've already taken one or two shots for vaccination, there may be a, the need of a booster shot. The highly transmissible Delta variant cases have been rising globally, mainly among the unvaccinated. Some states have already placed restrictions back in their states that may cause people to go into seclusion again. Fear will rise again and protection gear will become commonplace everywhere. During a recent press briefing, CDC Director Rochelle Walensky said, although we expected the Delta variant to become the dominant strain in the United States, this rapid rise is troubling. With this rapid rise, the idea of hugging one another is getting further and further away from us. We are such complex creatures and need the warmth of touch to heal us mentally, emotionally, and physically. Physical touch is what distinguish humans from other creatures. We become almost unrecognizable in the absence of touch. I read in an article that 200 years ago, French scientists spotted a creature running through the forest. Once captured, they determined that it was an 11-year-old that had run wild in the forest for much of his childhood. Originally, the child named Victor was determined to be incapable of communicating. French physicians and psychiatrists eventually concluded depravity of human physical touch, which retarded his social and developmental capacities. To bring this boy from acting wildly into a more controlled being, all he needed was a touch. If you've been watching this week the Olympics in Tokyo, you might have noticed, like me, something quite interesting. Even with the uprise of COVID cases in Tokyo since the games began, when a challenger wins the gold, they run to their coach or team member. They yell, they cry, they scream, and they have a full embrace. You know, along with that embrace comes sweat, 
tears, and mouth saliva. Yet it seems in these moments of victory, escalation, that touch is necessary. Here's another thing that I've noticed is, is that there are different language barriers and not everyone in the Olympics speaks English. Some speak Chinese, some speak Vietnamese, some speak French, some speak Lithuania, some speak Spanish, and some speak Russian. But they all understand the language of touch. This small gesture of congratulation evoked a smile that could kill darkness in our land. It is something about humans that we understand a warm embrace, a gentle handshake, a sympathetic hug, or a congratulatory pat on the back. Simone Biles dropped out of the team gymnastic events due to mental stress. Overwhelming support across the world showered her with words of encouragement and understanding about her mental state of being. I bet that nothing would make her feel better when under pressure or overwhelmed than just a touch cannot cure. In our text today, I am drawn to the synoptic gospels of which the book of Matthew is one. Matthew, who is the presumed author of the gospel of Matthew, was a Jew. His job was to collect taxes on behalf of the Roman government from his Jewish community. However, in his doing so, he raised the tax rates and swindled more money out of the Jews to line his own pockets. It was while Matthew was at the boot of customs that Jesus found him, called him, and said, follow me. From that point on, Matthew did not care about any money or, or even the job. He left it all to follow Jesus. Matthew speaks to the Jews about what he saw, about what he heard, and about what he knew to be true about Jesus in his writing. Matthew is the only synoptic gospel writer that gives us Jesus' genealogy trying to prove the authenticity of Jesus as the messianic king of the Old Testament prophecy. Here is what we learned that Jesus, about Jesus from Matthew, that Jesus came down 42 generations. Some important women in his lineage had questionable social and ethnic backgrounds like Rahab, who was considered to be a prostitute, like Ruth, who was a foreigner, and Bathsheba, who ended up having an adulterous relationship with King David. Yet each was a queen in their own rights and necessary in Jesus' lineage. And although Jesus came from a distinguished bloodline of queens and kings, it was not his human DNA that made him the king. His father's DNA made him the Messiah and king due to his immaculate conception. Matthew wanted his readers to understand that King Jesus had shown up upon the earth and was ready to heal all manners of sickness and disease. In fact, Jesus went around touching folks, healing them of every kind of sickness. In our text in chapter 14, Matthew reveals four different accounts of Jesus in motion and ministry. Matthew provided a firsthand account of what took place. The chapter begins with the death of John the Baptist. John the Baptist was a forerunner for Jesus Christ, going throughout the land telling the people to repent because the kingdom was at hand and that a coming Messiah would take on the sins of the world. John's bold message came calling a spade a spade led him to prison and later beheaded and his head was served on a platter all for the sake of telling the truth john's disciples got his body buried him and went and told jesus and became followers of jesus christ we can learn from even this death experience that we still have jesus we can talk to even when the world is against us. 
Jesus will never leave or forsake us. Then Matthew mentions in this same chapter the miracle of the feeding of 5,000. A multitude of people follow Jesus to this desolate place. Jesus, seeing the great assembly, had compassion on the multitude and healed their sick. When the disciples wanted to send them away, Jesus took five loaves of bread and two fish and gave thanks. Jesus blessed it and fed over 5,000 hungry folks. We can learn from this miracle that Jesus will be there for us even when we're hungry. He will never leave us or forsake us. Then Matthew records in the same chapter the miracle of walking on water. Peter and the other disciples, you remember the story, were in the boat crossing over to the other side when waves began beating against the boat and they were trying to manage the storm and the sea. The disciples saw a man walking on water at the nighttime and became terrified, crying out in fear. It was Jesus on the water, and Jesus spoke and told them not to be afraid. Peter, being bold enough to get out of the boat, said, If it is you, Lord, grant me or bid me to come. And Jesus said, Come. Peter was the only one that got out of the boat and walked toward Jesus. However, when he took his eyes off Jesus, he began to sink. And he cried out, Lord, save me. I don't know about anybody else, but I want God to save me when I'm getting in my wayward times. Jesus grabbed his hand or touched him. And together they walked on water back to the boat. We can learn from Peter's experience that when high and stormy gales come into our lives, we still have an anchor in Jesus. Jesus can throw out a lifeline and reel us back into the boat. Jesus will never leave us or forsake us. I wondered what more Matthew needed to explain in this chapter after the significant events of death, feeding of 5,000 hungry souls and Peter and Jesus walking on water, you would think that that's enough in chapter 14. Yet Matthew had one more lesson for us to learn in this chapter. It was during this time on earth that many were opposed to Jesus' teaching and miracle working power. Of all those he saved, delivered, and healed, more and more rejected his wonder working power. Matthew needed us to understand that not everybody will accept Jesus in us. Even when miracles are happening in our lives, people will reject our God and our Savior. In Matthew's last event, he takes us to the place of Gennesaret. Jesus went there to get away from the multitude and where the disciples headed in the boat. Gennesaret was a small piece of land, only three and a half miles long, and about two miles wide. Yet it was a very fruitful and productive strip of land. Its name means garden of riches because it was a place in which the seasons and the climate came together, producing beyond anyone's expectations and closely connected with Capernaum where Jesus had done mighty works. Matthew introduces us to the people in the land. And if the land was rich, then the people were rich. They were humble farming folk and knew that planting in good soil would yield great crops because the spoons, the spores of Jesus' miracles had landed on their ears from Capernaum. They knew that having Jesus in their land meant that good fruit would produce. Matthew 13 and 23 tells us that he who receives seed on the good ground is he who hears the word and understands it, who indeed bears fruit and produces some a hundredfold, some 60 and some 30. So there are a few things that I want to touch upon from Matthew's text, 14, 34 through 36. The first thing about these people in the land of Gennesaret is that they recognized Jesus. 
When they had crossed over, they landed at Gennesaret, and the men of that place recognized Jesus. Matthew tells us that Jesus landed, meaning that it was his destination and a planned trip. When we take a trip on the airplane and the plane lands, we send a message to our loved ones and say, we just landed or touched down. The message we are sending is the destination we planned for, we have arrived. Nothing Jesus did was unintentional. It was purposeful and planned. His leaving the multitudes and going to the other side was necessary for the humble, loving, and believing people he met when he arrived. I think Jesus touched down in the land of Gennesaret because he needed to show them that he was for them and he also would be by their side. There was an expectation of his arrival the moment he touched the ground. The people in the land felt elated when Jesus touched down and landed on their small piece of land. It was their season to receive healing. You all better hear me today. How long had they been suffering from sickness and disease? Was it only a few months? Was it a COVID year and a half or several years? The people of this rich land found out that their blessing had come to their land. They recognized who the Jews rejected. The Bible tells us in Matthew 21 and 14 that the stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. The Lord has done this and it is marvelous in our eyes. It seems like Jesus took every opportunity to use the Jews' rejection to build a larger group of believers. The fine people of Gennesaret were more than farmers and goodwill folks. They were believers based on what they heard. Their season and climate connected the moment Jesus got out of the boat with his disciples. Oh, I wish we could understand this and hear the testimony of others and believe that Jesus can and Jesus will in our lives also. Creflo Dollar once said it like this, if God did not want me to believe that he was a healer, God should have never put it in the Bible. He should have never made it so that I could read it. He should have never made it so that I can see who he had healed. I think we could say the same thing about God being a deliverer or a rescuer, a savior, a, a provider, a restorer, or a present help in the times of trouble. If God did not want me to believe it, it should not have been in the Bible. Because if we can find an example of what God did in the Bible or on the lives of many of his believers, then we can claim those same blessings because God is no respect of persons. And if God did it for them and he did it for you and me, then God can do it for us. We can claim it. It's ours. And if you don't get anything else out of this sermon, get this, that when Jesus comes to your town, steps on your block, shows up at your front door, it's your time and it's your turn. Second thing that Matthew points us in this passage, 14, 34, and 36, that they spread word about Jesus. They sent word to all of the surrounding country. Since they recognized Jesus and knew when he arrived, they ran and told everyone, not just their family and friends or their neighbors or those on their small piece of land, but they told those in the surrounding country. Jesus told us to share and spread the word. Listen to what Acts 1 and 8 says that, uh, and what Jesus told the apostles, he told them to tarry until the power from the Holy Ghost comes so that you can be witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Oh, we ought to be like the apostles. The same command that Jesus gave them is the same command that Jesus gives us that we ought to go and spread the word. We ought to become witnesses for Christ. The people of Gennesaret, knew how to spread the word about Jesus being in their land. They held nothing back. They told everyone. 
Perhaps the people of Gennesaret heard about the woman that Jesus met at the well. While Jesus sat at Jacob's well at noon, the hottest part of the day, a Samaritan woman came to the well to draw water. She destined this time and planned to draw water to avoid the stares of the other women. Her life was not perfect. Jesus revealed that he knew she'd had five husband, husbands and was now living with a man who was not her husband. Not only did the woman destined and plan to be at the well at noon, but Jesus said to his disciples, I must go through Samaria. Jesus met the woman at the well during a time of rejection. He brought his disciples to a place that they rejected. It happened at a time during Jesus' rejection. Jesus offered her something no other person did. He offered her living water so that she never had to draw from the well again. And after her conversation with Jesus without any mask or things to conceal his sincerity for her healing, this woman left her water jar, returned to town and spread the word and said, come see a man who told me all that I ever did. Although we have experienced great miracles from Jesus and we have heard how Jesus has healed and saved others, we have seen with our own eyes Jesus' miracle working power, we remain silent. But we must be like the woman at the well and tell everybody about what we know about Jesus. Lord, help us to not be afraid to spread the word. Not only can we learn in this text about what the people in the land did, but another thing that I, I want to point out and give you bring to your attention is that they brought the sick to Jesus. Scripture says that people brought all their sick to him. The people of Gennesaret knew enough about Jesus that they went and got their sick and brought them to Jesus. Perhaps they had heard what Matthew wrote in the fourth chapter in the 23rd and 24th verses. Matthew says Jesus went throughout Galilee teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and healing every disease and sickness among the people. The people brought to him all who were ill with various diseases, those suffering severe pain, the demon-possessed, those having seizures, and the paralyzed, and he healed them. Throughout the New Testament, Jesus healed the sick for those who had the faith to believe. But it was the preaching and teaching of the word of God that builds faith to receive physical healing from Jesus. The Apostle Paul tells us that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And so as we tell people about Jesus and Jesus' divine healing, faith will rise in them and they will reach out to the Lord for healing. We can see in Matthew 17 about a man who brought his son suffering from seizures and acting wildly to Jesus. All he asked was, Lord, have mercy on my son. Jesus rebuked the demon and healed the boy that very hour. See, he was desperate for a touch, a word, or a look from Jesus, so he brought his son to Jesus. This father's need is not unlike our needs today. When we meet on our Wednesday and Monday and Wednesday prayer calls, we bring the sick, the bereaved, the lost to Jesus. Our desire on that call is to ask the Lord to touch, heal, and deliver, and save. Let me tell you, we cannot get what we need from Jesus if we do not come to Jesus. Jesus said to the man with the sick son, bring the boy here to me. Then Jesus rebuked the demon and he came out of the boy who received healing at that moment. So if we want immediate healing, we must take our sicknesses and our sick loved ones to Jesus. How can we bring our sick to Jesus for a touch? 
We can do that by telling the sick what God's word says about Jesus having died for both their sins and their sickness. Listen to what, how uh, Peter, 1 Peter, tells us in 2 and 24 that he bore our sins in his body on the cross so that we might die to sins and live for righteousness by his wounds. You have been healed. Not only that, we can bring our sick to Jesus for a touch by praying the prayer of faith on behalf of the sick. Listen to how James Fifth chapter reads it. It says the prayer offered in faith will make the sick person well. The Lord will raise them up. Pray for each other so that healing occurs. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. And then another way that we can bring our sick to Jesus is by encouraging the sick to come personally to Jesus in prayer for their healing. John 14 and 14 says, you may ask me for anything in my name and I will do it. So we can encourage the sick to call upon Jesus to receive their body, to receive the healing in their bodies, and that Jesus will be able to touch them and relieve them from all forms of sickness. Lastly, what I want to point out that Matthew brings our attention to in the 14th chapter, 34th and 36th verse, Matthew says that the people in the land, they begged to touch Jesus. They begged him to let the sick just touch the edge of his cloak and all who touched it were healed. This was not just begging for the sake of begging. This was also not begging or not asking for something frivolous. This was desperation. This was heightened expectation. This was sheer exasperation. I believe these folks were tired of being sick and tired. They were tired of dying without the medical help they needed and tired of suffering. They were tired of dealing with grief and being in sorrow, just tired. So they brought the sick to Jesus to be healed. Here's what I like about what Matthew tells us. They did not meet, they did not need Jesus to speak a word. Look their way uh, or, or even stretch out his hands. Their request was just to touch his garment. Let me say that again. They did not need Jesus to speak a word. They did not need Jesus to look their way or even to stretch out his hand. Their request was just to touch his garment. Perhaps they had heard about the woman with the issue of blood who was a Gentile from Caesarea Philippi. Her disease was a chronic hemorrhage that she had for 12 long years, and she found no relief from the physicians. In Mark's gospel, he stated that she was nothing better, but rather grew worse. Luke himself, a physician, says that she had spent all of her living under physicians and could not be healed by any. Although we don't know her name, we do know her situation. We could not go out or uh, she could not go out or touch her family members. She could not enjoy a normal life and was constantly debilitated. She made up her mind that she had been sick too long. She was sick and tired of being sick and tired. And since the healer was in town, she found a way to get to Jesus and touch the hem of his garment. I am sure that all she said in her mind was, if I can get close enough to just touch. The Bible tells us that immediately after touching Jesus, her, her condition dried up and healing occurred. Hers was not faith without a touch or a touch without faith. She believed. She touched and she was healed. The people of Gennesaret only wanted what the woman received. They wanted just a touch. However, it was not in touch, but it was in believing in the healer's ability. It was not just in the touch, but it was in believing the healer's ability. Ability. Let me say, it was not in the touch. It was in believing the healer's ability. We cannot believe in the healing 
and not believe in the healer. The text tells us that all who touched Jesus' garment were healed. The people of Gennesaret recognized Jesus and told everyone they knew that Jesus had touched down in their land. They brought all of their sick to Jesus. I like this part because they were not selfish with their knowledge. They cast their cares upon the one who cares. It says people brought all their sick to him and begged him to let the sick just touch the edge of his cloak. And all who touched it were healed. They did not have to get real close to Jesus. They just wanted to touch a fringe. They wanted to touch a thread. They just wanted to touch an end. They needed a touch. They knew, being humans, that a touch will do really good. Just a little touch will do wonders for our mental, our emotional, and physical well-being. Today, we are suffering from skin hunger and touch starvation. It is making us moody, challenging to live with, excessively whining, having bad attitudes, and in some cases, being downright evil. Our conditions have made us or are making us sick. Even in this worshiping service, many of us need just a touch from Jesus. As we face the rise of COVID cases, the increased wearing of masks, and the separation of family and friends, just know that you can call on the name of Jesus for just a touch. None of us are more than a cry or an ask away for us to touch the hem of Jesus' garment and be healed, you can still touch Jesus. Sometimes just a little touch from Jesus will make everything all right. And so if you need a touch today, just, just lift up your hands and touch heaven. If you are desperate for healing today, just lift up your hands and touch heaven. If you are in high expectation of a change in your condition, just lift up your hands and touch Jesus. If you are exasperated or frustrated about your situation, just lift up your hand and touch Jesus. Jesus came down on earth so that we might be able to touch him. And we can do that today. All we have to do is believe, have faith, and receive. And we can still touch Jesus. Let me pray a final word of prayer. Dear Lord, we need your touch for our physical, emotional, and mental well-being. Just a touch from you is all we need to be healed. Touch our world and lift us out of the miry clay of COVID. Touch our lives and heal us from all manners of sickness and disease. Touch our families and shield them from the evil present in this world. As we call upon you, hear and answer our heartfelt prayers. Let those that see our light be forever reminded of your grace within us. Amen. Be blessed. Just a touch will do. open this virtual altar just for you. Remember, Jesus came to this earth to touch us. Jesus has already opened up the doors and said, come. All we have to do is accept Jesus Christ as our personal savior, believe that Jesus died, rose, and ascended to the Father, and confess our sins unto the Lord. It's just as simple as ABC, accept, believe, and confess. At this time, this altar is welcoming you at South Suburban Missionary Baptist Church. And so if you do not have a church home, you can join this body of believers who are committed to doing the work of Jesus Christ until our eternal rest. 
come join us. Come be a part of South Suburban Missionary Baptist Church. Or if you have never accepted Jesus as your personal savior, what a great time, what a wonderful opportunity it is for you today to join and say, I want to be saved. Salvation is yours. It is free. So come and join at this time. All you have to do is enter your information in the comments section and say, I want to join or I want to be saved. We will reach out to you immediately and welcome you into the family and the body of believers. While you're yet thinking, while you're making up your mind and deciding today to make Jesus your choice, let me say a word of prayer. Dear Jesus, we choose you today to be our savior. God, as we accept your son Jesus and believe that you have raised him from the dead and confess our sins unto you alone, restore unto us the joy of your salvation and uphold us with your right hand. Help us keep our thoughts pure and our hearts sincere from this day forward. Amen. Amen. Thank you for being part of this worshiping service. To prepare for communion this morning, I will be reading Matthew chapter 26, verses 17 through 30 for you from the New King James Version, and it reads as follows. Now on the first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread, the disciples came to Jesus saying to him, where do you want us to prepare for you to eat the Passover? And he said, go into the city to a certain man and say to him, the teacher says, my time is at hand. I will keep the Passover at your house with my disciples. So the disciples did as Jesus had directed them and they prepared the Passover. When evening had come, he sat down with the 12. Now as they were eating, he said, Assuredly, I say to you, one of you will betray me. And they were exceedingly sorrowful, and each of them began to say to him, Lord, is it I? He answered and said, He who dipped his hand with me in the dish will betray me. The Son of Man indeed goes just as it is written of him. But woe to that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would have been good for that man if he had not been born. Then Judas, who was betraying him, answered, Rabbi, is it I? He said to him, You have said it. As they were eating, Jesus took the bread, blessed it, and broke it, and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. Then he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you, for this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. But I say to you, I will not drink of this fruit of the vine from now on until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. And when they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. And the word of the Lord is already blessed. Let us pray. Dear, gracious, and heavenly Father, we just thank you, Lord God, for this day, Lord God, that, that you have genuinely made, Lord God, and created. Lord God, a day that we never seen before, God, we thank you for going to the cross for us, God. Not only just going to the cross for us, God, but not, not, not coming down from the cross, Lord God. You stay there, Lord God. Some say, Lord God, you never said a mumbling word, Lord God. I thank you for dying for us, Lord God. We thank you for your, your, your blood, Lord God, the blood that heals, the blood that saves, the blood that set free and deliver, God. God, we thank you for your sacrifice, Lord God, for us. So God, we give you glory, we give you honor, and we give you praise, Lord God. We cannot thank you enough, Lord God. If we had 10,000 tons, we cannot thank you enough for your sacrifice. We promise to give you the glory and the honor. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
about taking communion corporately that shakes, shocks, and shoves this world and destroys the plans of the enemy. One of the things that Jesus did when he came to this earth is that he met with his disciples in the upper room and he broke bread with them. He communed with him. He had wine with them. And he even washed the disciples' feet. All Jesus asks of us today is that we would remember him and remember what he did. Jesus, who came down 42 generations, has already done all the work. He walked around this earth that we live on and he went around healing all manner of sickness and disease. Jesus has already done all the work. Not only that, but he was crucified, tried and crucified for doing nothing but good. Jesus has done all the work. He took nails in his hands and nails in his feet. He stayed on the cross and didn't say a mumbling word just for you and me. Jesus has already done all the work. All we have to do today is to remember what Jesus has done. As we prepare to take our communion on today, I ask that you would reflect on the things Jesus has done even in your life. As we prepare, grab your elements, your bread, and your juice or wine as we get ready to partake of the Lord's Supper. When Jesus was in the upper room, he took the bread, he gave thanks and blessed it and said, do this in remembrance of me. Let us eat. The scriptures tell us that Jesus poured wine. He sent it around to all of the disciples and said, drink, drink remembering what I've done here and what I will do on Calvary. And so I'm reminded of what the songwriter said. The songwriter said, what can wash away our sins? And then the songwriter answered himself and said, nothing but the blood of Jesus. The songwriter asked another question and said, what can make me whole again? And answered himself again and said, nothing but the blood of Jesus. As we prepare to drink, we can look in the cup and see all that Jesus did. The wine represents the blood that Jesus shed on Calvary for you and me. So as we prepare to drink, let us remember what Jesus has done. Let us drink. Now, since we have taken of the bread and of the wine, let us celebrate. Let us celebrate the fact that we have a relationship with Jesus, that we know Jesus and the pardon of our sins, and that we are reflecting today on what Jesus has done. Jesus has done all the work. We now turn our attention to giving. South Suburban Missionary Baptist Church believes in giving. We give of our tithes and our offerings. Luke 6 and 38 helps us because it says, Give and it shall be given unto you in good measure. Press down, shaken together and running over shall men give unto your bosom. We believe that as we give, God will return it back unto us. I even like what Malachi 3 and 10 says, and it says that God will open up the windows of heaven, multiple, multiple windows, the windows of heaven, and pour out blessings that we won't have room enough to receive. So as we give today in our tithes, tithes for us is 10% of our earnings, and in our offerings, which is above and beyond that, 
we ask that you would participate with us in this time of giving. This is still part of our worshiping service and we invite you to join us at this time. How can you give? Well, you can give in one of three ways. One way is to send a donation or drop a donation off to South Suburban MB Church at 15201 South Lexington in Harvey, Illinois, 60426. You can also give by way of PayPal at paypal.me slash SSMBC. You can also give by calling our church to use the automated Square app at 708-333-9521. Three ways to give. Won't you participate with us at this time in giving? We are a church where God is up to something and big things are happening in this ministry. At this time, I would like those who are joining us by way of invitation to enter into the comment section your name and who invited you to service. We thank you for joining us and we pray that you were touched by a song, a prayer, or the spoken word of God. Join us for evening prayer every Monday and Wednesday night at 8 p.m. Central Time as we cast our cares on the one who cares. Please join us on Zoom using the access code 852-7986-1560 or call our conference number at 312-626-6799. Just like it takes a village to raise a child, it takes the grace of God and a prayerful community to make the church run like clockwork. This month, Midweek Moments will highlight all the teams that work behind the scenes at SSNBC. Join us every Wednesday at noon to learn about our ministry at work. Life groups are where liberation, imagination, fulfillment, and education happen, and where we engage in foundational teaching on God's Word to live better lives. There are three options to engage with us right from your home. Join us on one of these three days. Mondays or Tuesdays at 7 p.m. or Thursdays at 2 p.m. by way of Zoom using the access code 852-7986-1560 or call our conference number at 312-626-6799. Although we are still worshiping from home during this time, there is still much work to take care of in God's physical house. SSNBC invites you to join Campaign 300 as we work to raise funds to support our building fund and ensure proper maintenance of our church. If you would like to donate to this cause, you can do so via church drop-off, PayPal, or by calling our automated Square app. Job chapter 12 verse 12 tells us that wisdom belongs to the aged and understanding belongs to the old. The oldest generations are the true gems of the church. We can learn so much about how to live and praise God through them. SSNBC invites you to help celebrate our older members on August 15th for Senior Sunday via Facebook Live and YouTube. SSNBC would like to recognize all those with birthdays or anniversaries this month. May the blessings of the Lord overtake you in such a marvelous way, and may your days be filled with God's love and compassion. Join us next Sunday by way of Facebook Live or YouTube together in Sunday worship. Meet us here at the same time and same station as we worship the same God. Now we will have final remarks from our pastor. We thank you for coming to worship with us on this Sunday. I hope that you have been touched by a word, by a song, by a prayer, by a scripture, and that God is tremendously blessing you. Let me pray over our lives before we exit and leave this worshiping service. Lord, as we leave this place, God, please protect us. Bless us indeed and enlarge our territory. Keep us from all evil and do not allow the enemy to grieve us. And Lord, as we wait for your plan to unfold in our lives, 
Give us the patience we need. Remind us of the peace we can access when we take time to still ourselves before you and remember that you are God. We thank you that you are both sovereign and gracious. Now unto God that is able to keep us from falling and to present us faultless before the presence of God's glory with exceeding joy. To the only wise God our Savior, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and ever. Amen. Be blessed. Thank you.